Hello everyone, uh, welcome to PMF IS Current Affair Prelims Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik and this is the discussion on test number 6. This is your first part where we will be discussing the first 20 set of the questions and will make you understand how to approach these kind of questions in your upcoming prelims. Well, I hope you are liking these, these particular videos. If you like the way we are discussing things, don't forget to give a like on this video and do tell us your feedback in the comment as well. But before we begin guys, now as you know the uh, UPSC prelims is approaching soon and to ace the exam you need to practice high quality MCQs. Well you have a chance to subscribe to the PMF IS test series and this prelim test series is now available at a very special price of 4 double line. If you have not yet checked out, do check it out. The link is in description and get your prelim test series at a very affordable price with the high quality MCQs. Now let's get started with the test number 6 where the very first question was with respect to the Interpol. Now we know the meaning of Interpol is International Police. That is the full form of the Interpol. Now again this question was uh, with respect to Interpol and uh, uh, to solve this question of course you need to have certain information base. First let's understand what Interpol is and what specific things we need to know about it. Now looking at the Interpol. So as the name says international police, this is an international organization and as the name suggests, this organization is going to be one stop solution for cooperation, collaboration among the law enforcement agencies from different countries where all the countries have a platform in the name of Interpol where they can come together and combat the transnational crimes, the crimes that are happening across the countries, in multiple countries. Now this is world's largest international police organization and this is very old as well. Approximately 100 years back in 1923, Interpol was established. Right now it has 196 members and where India is also one of the important members of Interpol. Now please understand when it comes to the functions and even before that, now who head the Interpol? It is headed by the Secretary General who is appointed by the General Assembly. Now this can be an important uh, information for the upcoming prelims. Now when it comes to the functions, so Interpol has multiple functions. It, it facilitates the cross-border police cooperations. Interpol is also responsible for information sharing, coordination, collaboration between different countries when it comes to international organized crimes. Of course, it is the Interpol that maintains several global databases and it has information on various types of crimes. It, it has data on huge number of criminals, all the international players. So it is a repository of data you can understand. And that too in different domains of crimes like terrorism, human trafficking, drug trafficking, cyber crime. And in order to get the particular criminals trapped or in helping out, reaching out to, the, to these criminals, uh, this organization is very powerful because you know it, it issues some color coded notices where it can alert the members about some individuals who are wanted internationally or about some missing person. So it has a very huge network. I mean 196 member country is not, is not a small thing no. It covers the entire world you understand. Now when it comes to the notices this is very important for you to know that whenever uh, Interpol has to convey any message it, it has a lot of uh, notices at play. Like for example, uh, if Interpol wants somebody to be caught and it wants to designate somebody as a wanted person, so against that person it issues the red notice. Red notice is always for the wanted person. If there is any missing body where uh, the identification needs to be done, then Interpol issues a yellow notice. Why I'm telling you guys, you never know. Sometimes you may have a question on match the following. You will be given a color code and for which purpose that color notice is given. At least you should be aware of that. So yellow notice is for missing persons. Blue notice is given if there is any additional information required on some individual or organization. If there is an unidentified bodies for that purpose, the black notice is issued. Similarly, if there is anything with respect to warning, intelligence, green notice is issued. If there is any kind of imminent threat which is, uh, which is popping up in some corner of the world, then Interpol issues the orange notice as a threat alert. 
or if uh, and similarly it has many uh, such kind of uh, you know notices so you do read about the notices remember try to remember the color and for what purpose they are issued now since i have mentioned that india is also member of the interpol now from indian indian side it is the cbi that is designated as a nodal agency who is going to represent india at the interpol so cbi is the national central bureau for interpol in india it is like the face of india the representative representation of india is done through cbi okay please remember that now if you if you go back to the uh, question now the question was with respect to the three statements uh, about the interpol so clearly you can say sir first and second are absolutely correct without any issue first statement clearly says yes interpol is um, it maintains a lot of global databases of course it does now you please understand even if you are not aware of that you you, you can apply your common sense if there is anything called international police of course it is going to have because the police work has lot of database involved right so of course this this statement has to be correct now the only problem with the statement was with respect to statement number 3 because now that the same thing i was mentioning you have to be careful about the color notice and the purpose now the question says yellow notice is for seeking the location arrest of a person was that the yellow notice no yellow notice was with respect to the missing bodies it is the red notice which is with respect to the arrest of the person most wanted person or something like that no so be very careful this international police notices are very very important so here the answer is going to be only two i would say this question was a medium one medium kind of uh, medium level question but uh, yes you can definitely attempt it but if you are not sure if you have not if you have no idea about the color notices then you you should skip because because there is no way you can uh, decode it there are more chances of you going to get the statement wrong because in the colors there are, there is absolutely nothing you can do about it right so try to read the colors it's very important guys now the second question is uh, with respect to the knowledge of your maps now the question very straight forward question it says bab al mandav strait a very famous choke point within the indian ocean uh, territory now babal mandab connects which two following which two water bodies i hope you know the meaning of a strait right when whenever you mention the word strait strait is a i mentioned earlier also strait is a narrow water body that connects the two larger water bodies in case of babal mandab it is actually the red sea and the gulf of aden i'll show you on the map very easy question very straight away the question was asked apps and this too this strait is also very famous so i don't think any excuse that upsp upsc aspirants don't have the idea about the uh, this particular thing now first look at the babal mandab only so as you can see this is your red sea and if you want to go out of the red sea and if you want to enter the gulf of aden now this is a very narrow water body called the bab al mandab now don't get confused there are two important strait in the area one is strait of hormuz if you want to go from persian gulf if you are entering the gulf of oman then you have strait of hormuz and 90% students they always mix up the two so don't get the two things mixed up red sea gulf of aden is babal mandab and persian gulf and gulf of oman is hormuz so try to remember the two locations very very clearly because these two both of them are very important choke points and why i'm calling them choke points because strategically they are absolutely important like for example now this is your suez canal right now what is the point if you are not like this is your mediterranean sea so if you are coming from mediterranean sea which is extension of atlantic only so from there if you are coming through the suez canal you are entering red sea and then you want to go out from gulf of aden you are entering arabian sea and then indian ocean please understand there is absolutely no relevance of suez canal if anything happens at this point please understand if babal mandab is choked or it is blocked by some nonsense activities or it is blocked by some kind of anti uh, you know uh, anti anti social elements or there is any kind of terror activity or any military activity at that the whole route get disrupted and you understand how much importance even today we have with respect to suez canal red sea and recently there has been trouble going on 
in this region guys yes in the backdrop of the israel palestine conflict which is happening somewhere here you see the houthi rebels are actually attacking the merchant ships from yemen the houthi rebels are somehow backed by iran iran has the backing to the houthi rebels and they are attacking and blocking situation in red sea and that is where the babal mandav is in news constantly it's a choke point it is it is it is very crucial for connecting mediterranean via red sea to the indian ocean if that does not happen the entire trade is going to get blocked and similarly is the case with strait of hormuz so be very careful now these now i always say wherever there are important straits important isthmus you have to be clear about so for example i just mentioned strait of hormuz so now remember it is it is between the persian gulf and the gulf of oman we have the strait of hormuz now similarly another other options also i need to discuss like for example the question was which is the strait that connects the labrador sea and the baffin bay if you have to connect the two then it is the davis strait you can see clearly now this is your davis strait the east side of canada and that is the one that connects the labrador sea which is somewhere here and it connects the baffin uh, bay uh, to the north right so this this particular part is your labrador sea and here you have the baffin bay so the two small larger water bodies are connected by the davis strait so please remember at least try to on your on the map now this is your whole work on the map try to uh, see all the important straits and and the isthmus and that too with the with the ocean wise now first try to pick up all the important straits of indian ocean then prepare separately for atlantic separately for pacific that way it becomes easy for you to remember like for example another important choke point we have is called the kerch strait now kerch strait was also very much in the news so do expect question coming on that also it is the one that connects connects the black sea and the sea of azov now because this is near ukraine it is the southern part of ukraine where you have the kerch strait so by default there are chances you may have a question coming on the kerch strait as well okay so do remember which particular strait connect which to water bodies very basic question but important guys now another question that is uh, that is about the hatti community now again this hatti community was very very much in the news so do expect these kind of questions or any if there is any community any tribal population that is in the news in the last 12 years 12 months becomes absolutely important relevant for your exam upsc mainly target all the communities uh, that were in the news in the past one year so do prepare that part as well and do expect questions coming on some tribes tribes names their location tribal groups their speciality now these are certain kind of things which ups is always fond of and may ask you for example now this time the question is about the hatti community now this community okay now first let's try to understand which statements are correct with with respect to the hatti community so if you look at the statements you will understand so this community was in news uh, because it was actually demanding this community was in news for demanding that uh, they wanted to the they wanted the implementation of the law that actually gave this community the st status now recently initially they were not a part of the scheduled tribe status but then the hatti community was included in the st list now that is a thing that now interesting part is this uh, community belongs to himachal pradesh okay now remember the state for every tribe there is absolutely no point remembering the name of the tribe without their state so always remember the tribe along with the states interestingly they were included in in the st tribe just before the uh, vidhan sabha elections of himachal pradesh now i'm not saying it i'm saying it now politics is all about the timing right okay now coming to the question so remember hathi communities are they are close knit communities very uh, you know very, very deep social bonding we have in this community and primarily this uh, community resides in himachal some of the tribes of the community you will also find presence in uttarakhand now these particular tribes uh, uh, you know they, why they are called hatti the word hatti actually came uh, the word their their name hatti is because of their traditional occupation because most of the people of this tribe they are engaged in selling the home grown crops vegetable meat and wool and they sell it in their small small markets 
and in local areas that small market is called hut you know so that is why the name is hutti community and interestingly the hutti communities are governed by traditional council called the kumbil like kumbli like the the same way in haryana we have the khap we have the khap panchayats you no know, at a, at the local level governance so similarly even the hutti community has a local level governance and they are governed by their traditional councils and in in the case of hatti the traditional councils the grass root councils administrative units are called the kumbli so remember the name kumbli as well as you we have khap in haryana and uh, remember the constitution order in 2023 granted them st status before that they were not into the st list now if you look at the question now you have the information if you look at the question guys then of course the first statement has a problem hatti community you have just understood they belong to the state of himachal and uttarakhand so definitely they does not they don't belong to the chota nagpur region so that's why i'm emphasizing again and again do remember the name of the tribe but always remember it along with the state without because upsc always going to mix the two things very careful so first statement is wrong second is correct but again the third is problematic you know that this is factually incorrect hathi was in news because they were added in the schedule tribe so yes they are a part of schedule tribe now only one statement is correct now again this question if i go by uh, a very uh, common uh, you know common sense this question was a tough one why this was a tough one because this is heavily dependent on the facts so if you have not by chance you have not read about this topic then you you have to skip this question i do not see any way of solving it because because this is purely fact based questions you cannot do anything about it so in my opinion if you encounter this question and you are not aware at all then please skip no point taking risk no point getting into the negative marking guys but i i hope this if this comes to the uh, question then now you are fully prepared for the question right okay now the next question is uh, about the cyclone mishong now again this was very much in news you know the cyclones are named right so all the tropical cyclone not the extra tropical only the tropical cyclones are named and this practice also we started i think we started this practice after 2004 only like almost it it's been 15 20 years only we have started naming the tropical cyclones why they are named of course it becomes because see uh, tropical cyclones they do not have a fixed location now tropical cyclones uh in indian ocean you have the cyclones coming um uh, very frequently the location keeps changing some cyclones are in arabian sea some cyclones are in bay of bengal so and and that too like uh, at that also happens sometimes many cyclones come very back to back kind of scenario so in that particular case naming a tropical cyclone becomes very important so that we we know about what cyclone particularly we are referring and that is important for managing the cyclone giving the warning signs and uh, of course you know referring it for further case studies so that is the purpose we name the cyclones and how it is named so all the countries that are there in the nearby vicinity they are they are asked to give a, the name in advance like for example in case of indian ocean the eight countries every country gives eight name in in, in advance so so there is already a list of 64 names and the names that are given by the by uh, by the country like eight names they give mostly the names are given uh, which reflect some kind of culture some kind of you know something very special about that country now the name should not be derogatory of course uh, and uh, this time the cyclone mishong that we saw yes it was a tropical cyclone where the name mishong was given by myanmar this is correct but there is problem with the first statement now i as i told you uh cyclones they keep on changing their locations the cyclone mishong was not in arabian sea it was in bay of bengal so that makes our statement number 2 correct now this was a very easy question easily could have been attempted because this was in news and the state the question is asking the uh, you know very straight forward facts only simple things are being asked so now you can see here in the explanation part cyclone mishong which is actually pronounced as migjong we call it bishong but the the real pronunciation as per myanmar uh, it is called the migjong and this is this was the fourth tropical cyclone 
that we saw in 2023 in the Bay of Bengal. Now, of course, if you compare, uh, in general, uh, uh, Arabian Sea has comparatively less number of cyclones. Bay of Bengal generally has more number of cyclones in one particular year. But that is not a fact now. It is no more a fact because of the climate change, because of the global warming. Sometimes, we have seen in some years, even Arabian Sea has sometimes surpasses the number of cyclones. In general, Bay of Bengal is more favorable for that. But of course, given the global warming, things are becoming real difficult. Now, this cyclone uh, Mikjom made a landfall. Landfall is where the cyclones rotating, rotating and finally hits the land part. So, it made a landfall over Nellore, which is in Andhra Pradesh. Now, this is important for you to know about landfall because after landfall, once the landfall happens, the cyclone, because tropical cyclones, uh, they originate over the water bodies. This is very important, guys. If you compare it with the temperate cyclone, a temperate cyclone can form, can, can have the origin on the land as well as on the water. But tropical cyclones, they have their origin on the water bodies only. And when they, when they finally uh, go and hit the land area, from after landfall, the cyclone start dissipating. It starts getting decayed. So that landfalls are very important. Of course, landfall is going to be the area which is going to have the maximum negative impact. Of course, wherever there will be landfall, there will be huge rainfall and every negative scenario that is possible. So this time, this Mikjom made a landfall in Andhra Pradesh. Okay, simple question, but yes, informative and important guys. So I, I want you to at least uh, uh, do one thing. All the cyclones of 2023, all the cyclones that we saw, at least try to read them once, which cyclones were in Bay of Bengal, which were in Arabian Sea. So try to make a small list for your, uh, for your revision, quick revision, right? Okay, question number five was with respect to India Arctic program, uh, Antarctica program. Very, very important question about the Antarctica program. First, try to learn things about it and then we'll come back to the question. So when it comes to India's Antarctic program, now India has been a key player from the very beginning. In fact, in 1981 only, India started our first expedition to Antarctica. Remember, so we are into the business of exploring the Antarctica from a very long time. And for that purpose, we made this India Antarctica program. It's a scientific research exploration program under which particular body we are doing it. This whole program is done under National Center for Polar and Ocean Research. Now, this is very important, guys. Why I'm telling you, many times we have this confusion that where that uh, this Antarctica program is done under which ministry, which particular uh, uh, you know, organization, institute. So try to remember. Now, this, this organization is in Goa. So this National Center for Polar Ocean Research is responsible for every ocean research, not just the polar, even Antarctica and Arctic. Both expeditions are done under the organization. And it also includes the ocean research. So if you are going for any deep sea kind of missions, if the same organization is going to be the key player. Now, please understand Government of India, uh, uh, now we, we want to, we intend to operationalize a new research station. We are planning to have another research station on Antarctica. So, till date, India has got three stations. Uh, the very first station that we established on the Antarctica was Dakshin Gangotri that we established 1983. But right now, this, this station is no more functional because it was because of the avalanche and every and some other factors, some climatological factor, uh, this Dakshin Gangotri becomes non-functional. So the first station that we established was this. After that, we got another two stations. One was Maitri and then recently we got the Bharti. Maitri was the second one that we established 1981, 1988. It is still functioning. In 2012, we got the Bharti as India's first committed research a uh, facility that was located approximately 3000 km east of Ma uh, Maitri. Now we are, we are planning to have another one. We are planning to have another one new research station and that makes the things very, very interesting. Now, uh, so of course, if, if somebody asks you how many total stations we have got on that, so we have three. 
but how many permanent stations which are still functional so they are only two because Dakshin, Dakshin Gangotri is being uh, abandoned look at this beautiful map of Antarctica and there you can clearly see and you must know that the Maitri station is uh, towards the northern side and on the eastern side on the eastern Antarctica we got the Bharti station so the locations are important guys sometimes names are not enough you may be asked that which station is at which particular side of Antarctica so be very careful about it okay now you can see here as the question says so first statement is correct yes we have got the program under the NCPOR fine now look at the second statement again the same thing that I was telling you it says now we are planning to have another uh, station uh, in the West Antarctica near existing research base no we are trying to have another a new one on the eastern side of Antarctica so this statement is wrong and again the third is also wrong which is which says India has three permanent operational station no we have got three but operational only two so far so second and third are wrong first statement is correct now again again I'm telling you this was a tough question it was easy for a lot of people but tough if you are not aware again very heavily dependent on the facts can you guess any of them no I, ca I cannot guess I can't guess if there are two station or three stations so that way uh, I mean you can skip or you can take a risk if you if you if you have some idea about it but this for this kind of question you have to be very careful about because this is a purely fact based question guys now question number six was, was with respect to the OPEC organization of petroleum exporting countries now which statement are correct about the OPEC so first you should know certain interesting facts about the OPEC what is an OPEC guys well this OPEC is a permanent <clears throat> three words important one permanent number two intergovernmental organization and this was established in 1960 and this was done at the Baghdad conference so you may have another individual MCQ just based on this one line what is OPEC is it permanent yes is it intergovernmental yes and it's a very old organization 1960 and that was established by Baghdad conference now let's 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 imagine you may have a question coming on that so Baghdad conference is uh, uh, yeah Baghdad conference relates to the establishment of which of the following our options are WTO then you have the OPEC OECD or uh, uh, then you have the OE, huh, OECD or then you have the uh, Gulf Cooperation Council you may have the four options right so at least at least try to remember uh, in which conference by which particular you know uh, convention the important bodies are being established so when you when you talk about Baghdad conference it belongs to Bag uh, OPEC so remember that so as the name says as the name clearly says OPEC means oil producing and exporting countries so the founding members of the OPEC were Iran Iraq Kuwait Saudi and Venezuela right now right now there are even more members that have joined the OPEC and you have the list and you and you you make sure you remember the name of the members because you may have this question coming in your MCQ which of the following are not the member of OPEC so try to remember the names so today we have Algeria uh, Congo Gabon Equatorial Guinea Iraq Iran Kuwait Libya Nigeria Saudi Arabia UE Venezuela please remember a uh, Gabon rejoined the OPEC in 2016 it it left it in between but right now Gabon has rejoined the OPEC but there is one particular country Angola Angola recently Angola withdrew from the OPEC so you may have a question on that also Ki recently which of the following countries uh, left or you know has withdrew its membership of the OPEC so you you must remember the name which has rejoined is Gabon you may have a question on that also and which has recently withdrew that is Angola so try to remember both the informations right okay why OPEC is formed as as you know it's about the petroleum uh, exporting producing countries oil exporting petroleum countries so OPEC's main objective is to secure the fair stable prices for petroleum producers and since all important oil producing countries they they have made this group of course they are going to have their interests served because they do not want the prices to destabilize so they, the, every petroleum exporting countries wants a fair and stable prices 
and if you have a group of all the countries of course you have good bargaining power so all countries which whose economy is dependent on the oil of course they they have created this group for efficient economic regular supply of petroleum to the consuming nations and that is why that is why the opec was created when it comes to relations of opec and india india heavily dependent on the opec group why india sources almost 70% of our crude oil is coming from these opec countries 60% of our lpg 30% of our lng liquefied natural gas and 45% of our export uh, petroleum products is again coming from the opec countries so yes we have a very close dependence on the opec as you can see from the information now if you go back to the question guys if you go back to the question you will see all four statements are correct so in this case answer is supposed to be d but again <clears throat> again uh, can we do some elimination c uh, yes you can you can clearly see india's dependence on the opec yes of course if you are not even sure about 70% but at least you know that india is heavily dependent on the crude oil from the opec right at least so even just just uh, take it as a chance that i can still go for it like 70% i'm not sure but yeah india is heavily dependent so maybe it's it can be correct one now it is very difficult to guess which organization was formed by what particular conference now this information is quite tough of course another tough information is to guess the founding members i mean let's say i mean okay fine you if you think of the oil organization of petroleum exporting countries well if you think of the petroleum exporting countries uh you can think of the gulf countries right but what about venezuela i mean was venezuela founding member yes it is but is it easy to guess it is not very easy to guess so this question you have to be very very careful about first and fourth you can still guess but second and third is going to give you tough time so if you are not aware be very careful you you can take a risk but be very very careful about this question because that is fact based and makes the things very tough for you few things you can solve with the common sense but some things are very difficult to guess next question is about the arctic region okay now we just have understood the antarctic now i'm going to take you to the arctic region now let's understand the arctic region and let's understand few facts about it so why it is in news recently because our ministry of earth sciences in india the ministry of earth sciences launched india's first winter specific scientific expedition to the arctic and that is very important so you may have mcq separately coming on this information as well india's first winter scientific expedition uh, has been launched to antarctica no it is not antarctica it is arctic understood so you you should be careful so be careful which expedition we have launched to what particular part and always try to remember the ministry now if it says it is the ministry of uh, <clears throat> science and technology it is not it is ministry of earth sciences that is taking care of such kind of expeditions okay so yes ministry of earth sciences has launched india's arctic policy in 2022 please remember right now in the world the politics around arctic is going very very hot because the whole world has their interest in antarctic and now they are interested in arctic ocean as well so since since the global warming is happening more and more arctic region is becoming ice free the the countries around it have because because there is a there's a huge reserves of hydrocarbons in arctic so ex uh, uh, exactly every country <clears throat> every major player of the world wants to have some benefit from the arctic and for that purpose it makes sense why india created india's arctic policy dedicated arctic policies in 2022 and the india's arctic policy is based on the six important pillars number one we are interested in science and research we are also focusing on climate environment protection economic human development transportation connectivity governance international cooperation and national capacity building do expect a separate mcq star mark very very important question can be asked dedicatedly on india's arctic policy as well so try to remember the six pillars which are there in the arctic policy of india 
and yes again I told you when it comes to the nodal agency you know the name right it is the national center for policy and uh, uh, ocean research that we have and this particular uh, <clears throat> center it is in Goa under Ministry of Earth Sciences we have we have already learned it in the case of uh, the Antarctic region as well so whenever, whenever it comes to the polar research or the ocean research this is one stop that we have okay <clears throat> very common very look at the map around you if you look at the Arctic region basically Arctic region consists of the entire Arctic Ocean so any area which is above 66 and a half degree north so that that we call as Arctic line na? so all the area above that Arctic line is called the Arctic region so it consists of the Arctic Ocean uh, other than that it has also parts of Alaska which is part of USA so USA is also considered to be part of Arctic many people don't consider uh, don't uh, like forget to understand that he said why USA is in Arctic it is because of the Alaska Alaska is integral part of USA no uh, Canada of course then you have the countries like Finland Greenland and because Greenland belongs to Denmark so Denmark is also a stakeholder in Arctic region then you have Iceland Norway Russia Sweden so there are total eight members remember there are total eight members that are part or eight countries which are part of the Arctic region and Arctic Ocean is very important globally and into for the for the studies of geography as well because Arctic Ocean has the longest continental shelf in the world and you know the continental shelves are so important when it comes to economic they are economically very 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 crucial why it is the continental shelf only where you have the hydrocarbon deposits it is this shelf only where you have the maximum uh, maritime uh, biodiversity so economically geologically bio biologically every continental shelf is of very high importance and the longest continental shelves now you may have a question on that as well if let's say the question comes longest continental shelves are found in which of the following ocean options would be Arctic Ocean Indian Ocean Pacific Ocean Atlantic Ocean many many students make can make this mistake because now you have to remember it is the Arctic having the longest continental shelf so why I'm telling you all that because from this one information or one topic multiple questions can be created and you as an aspirant has to figure out and my suggestion to every one of you whenever you read any kind of uh, <clears throat> information anything that you read try to make your own MCQs if you are in a position to create your own MCQs then you are in a position to predict some of the questions coming in the exam now if you look at the statements all the statements are absolutely correct all three are correct yes the answer is supposed to be C my opinion is this question was a medium level uh, you can take a risk uh, at least like this may maybe you are not aware of this but at least first and second statements are very obvious very clear now third may have a tough part but you can still take a risk because at least you are in a position to figure out the first two which is very obvious and you just need to have a common sense and you just need to uh, visualize the Arctic region you can have all the information okay <clears throat> now going by the question number eight this question is with respect to the rare earth elements now the first statement says okay first let let me let me uh, let me tell you something about the rare earth because now this is also a very hot topic guys and do expect at least one or two to uh, questions coming on that because right now the topics about critical minerals the topic about rare earth is very very much in the news so what we have to figure out let's first try to understand so let's focus on this so called rare earth elements so what exactly is the meaning of rare earth guys well rare earth is a name that we give to group of 17 chemical elements which are these 17 chemical elements if you go to the basics of the periodic table the same periodic table that we we used to see in our chemistry labs whole our school days no so those uh, 17 chemical elements includes 15 lanthanide elements along that there is there is a whole table there is a whole series of lanthanides along with that we have two more called scandium and yttrium now very interestingly many people have this misbelief that rare earth oh I mean they must be they must be present in a small quantity that's why they are called rare earth no that is not the case 
let me surprise you by telling rare earth elements are relatively abundant in earth crust in the earth crust you have heavy presence of rare earth but then the question is sir why then they are called rare earth they are called rare because not because they have less volume available because they are found in low concentration and it is very difficult it is almost impossible to find them as an individual elements rare earth elements are mostly mixed with other minerals and that makes it very difficult for them to uh, to find them and then to extract them and that too in a commercial way i mean understand you if if you have to extract the element it has to be commercially viable you must be in a position to invest less make more profit then only you will do it no if i tell you sir uh, there is a there is 1 kg uh, uh, okay i'll i'll tell if i tell you there is 1 kg gold that is there uh, in your uh, house uh, you you have to dig a uh, 10 feet under your house you will get a 1 kg uh, you know uh, this thing but if in doing so your whole house is going to uh, dismantle of course that is not worth right so similarly the things has to be commercially viable so rare earth are not rare because you have less concentration they or you, they are not available or they are not present they are heavily uh, uh, abundant but the problem is because of the low concentration and mixture with other minerals it is difficult to extract them which country is the is the leader of rare earth it is china so china is today the world leader in rare earth and let me tell you rare earth application is almost in every field you have the application of rare earth in terms of aeronautical space defense so many so many uh, uh, fields are there where the application of rare earth is there we divide the rare earth into heavy rare earth elements and the light rare earth elements what is the difference between the two see the light ones are more abundant and the heavy rare earth are more critical more critical because there is heavy demand high demand of the heavy ones where these heavy ones are used heavy ones like you have the yttrium the cerium these kind of heavy rare earth are actually more in demand they are very critical because they are used for clean energy technologies and because they are because of their limited supply they have a small market and that makes them more critical similarly the light ones like like for example we have the neodymium that is very critical and it is used in mobile phones medical equipments electric devices all electric vehicles all these are utilize, uh, utilizing the uh, these one now here is a complete list if you want to just uh, check out the complete list you can have this complete list of all the 17 rare earth you don't have to cram you don't have to uh, cram all the names but at least try to remember the basics of this guys hai na so here in this case all the three statements are absolutely correct no problem with the with the three you can see all are absolutely correct but yes do remember the difference of heavy and the light one and do remember uh, what why rare earth is called rare elements okay so try to remember the logic answer is all three uh, the statement the question was a medium level but something you could have attempted because uh, the options are quite easy guys another question on the map knowledge that you have the question was with respect to the panama canal so panama canal connects which two water bodies very interesting so if you know the location you can easily understand the panama canal connects the atlantic with the pacific ocean i'll i'll show you on the map as well so very easy very straight forward question look at now you have to just go and check out the knowledge of your map so this is where the panama canal is right so we have this is called isthmus of panama you know what is the meaning of isthmus narrow strip of land connecting the two larger land areas so this is the panama and here we got the we got the panama canal and uh, this panama canal where we have got this panama so clearly we are connecting the caribbean sea caribbean sea is a part of atlantic ocean and this gulf of panama is a part of pacific ocean so we are connecting this and it is very crucial for the economy of north america why because if if there there is no passage available here then uh, then you know the north america has to take a complete round of south america and then has to go back to to connect its western coast because of the panama canal it becomes really easy to connect the two sides of the of the north america the eastern and the western side 
So Panama Canal is approximately, it's, it is approximately 80 kilometers long connecting the Atlantic and Pacific. This was actually, there was no, there was no natural passage. Of course, we have got, we have made this artificially. This waterway was actually cut through one of the narrowest saddles of the isthmus that joins North and South America. You can have this Panama as a country. And it was the US that built this canal somewhere between 1904-1914. And then it transferred to Panama in 1999. So very recently only Panama got the control. Okay, very interesting. And please remember, uh, these days, even Darien Gap is very much in the news. This Darien Gap is probably one of the most difficult part or most difficult terrain to survive because this Darien Gap is in news because of the illegal migration. A lot of, lot of people, they reach Colombia and by the route of donkey. You must have the word donkey after Shah Rukh Khan movie. It has become even more famous. So because of this donkey route illegal migration, lot of people go to Colombia and from there they try to sneak into uh, Mexico and USA. So Darien Gap is the most challenging part to cover because this there is nothing in Darien Gap. There is no road, no infrastructure and you have only forest and forest and what makes it more dangerous because lot of reptiles are there because it's, it's a complete forest land. Okay, so absolutely no services available. And plus, this Darien Gap is also used by the criminals, the, the drug uh, uh, traffickers. They, they use this gap and a lot, lot of time, uh, you know, some pirates also come there and uh, get you looted. So very dangerous uh, place to be at, Darien Gap, okay? Okay, so now we have this question number 10. Question number 10 is how many of the following countries are part of five eyes alliance? Now again, very interesting question. First of all, what is this five eyes alliance? You see, when I say I watch you, I am watching you. What eyes signifies? Eyes is about surveillance, you know. Five eyes alliance is all about the surveillance, okay. We, we call it very often, huh? I am watching you. So eyes means watching, surveillance. So there are very interest, very easy way to remember it. So let's say this is your world map. On the world map, there are five countries. They have got their best surveillance tactics and policies and equipments and you can remember it this way i'll tell you what exactly this means there are five countries as a part of five alliance so five alliance start from the north america so you have the canada you have the usa you have the uk and then you have australia and new zealand so you are covering the whole diagonal from north america to you are coming to the australia so entire world is being surveyed by this particular these five countries so very easy to remember no so if you if you if you use this method to remember it it becomes easy so is usa part uk part yes france is not a part russia is also not a part australia is a part so try to remember it this way these five dots can help you understand the five eyes alliance so here only three only three are the right answer very easy question very easy to attempt because it's a factual question and 5 i alliance is something which is in news lot of lot of time so going by more uh, specific knowledge so 5 i alliance is basically intelligence sharing alliance that we have between these five countries the core purpose of the 5 i's is to share the intelligence information collaborate on the matters when it comes to national securities and defense these five countries are going to collaborate these five countries are going to help each other why this was created when you when you when you trace the origin of the five eyes it actually goes back to the second world war during the second world war only it was us and uk they formalized this agreement and later on this was expanded and this was expanded when uh, canada joined this alliance 1949 new zealand australia joined it way back in 1956 so right now we have this is the group of five countries doing all the intelligence sharing across now you have question number 11 that talks about opera operation prosperity Guardi guardian now we have already discussed the background of this operation i told you under the back backdrop of israel palestine conflict the houthi rebels are attacking the merchant ships in red sea and they are being supported by iran so this is an operation this operation 
was actually started initiated by United States of America and the purpose is with you. US initiated it, now it's a multinational security initiative to counter the Houthi attacks in Red Sea. So that is the right answer, very easy, straightforward you can attempt this question. Uh, now to get into the details of that, so uh, remember, like you may have this question as a separate question itself. So try to remember the key points of this operation. Name itself says Operation Prosperity Guardian. Prosperity, why prosperity? Because Red Sea is a very important part of the trade route. You are, you are coming from Mediterranean to Suez to uh, 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 Red Sea, going to Indian Ocean. So it's a very, very important, probably the most important trade route that we have today. So of course, it is about the prosperity of the entire trade community, of, of course, all the prosperity of the related or nearby countries. So this USA has now shown its global leadership by starting this multinational security alliance and the purpose you know to give the safety to the commercial ships from the Houthi militants that we see and they are operating from Yemen and they are continuously attacking the Red Sea. Okay. Now, very interestingly, we already have discussed it in one of our tests, if you remember. So, this entire thing is being done. This whole operation is being done under the combined maritime forces. Do expect a separate question coming on the CMF. This combined maritime forces is actually, is actually one of the multi-naval task forces with 39 countries, 39 members that includes India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, US and Yemen. So if you have a question on CMF, so do remember India is also part of it. It's a group of 39 navies, okay. And uh, under the CMF, they have a very special task force called Task Force 153 that is being used to check the attacks in the Red Sea. So and this is a very, uh, very, this new task force 153 was actually set up recently in 2022. Basically, the purpose of this whole group the purpose of this combined task force was to improve the maritime security in areas like Red Sea, in areas like Babal Mandeb and the Gulf of Aden. So very dedicatedly for this entire region, you got a task force 153. You, might, you may have this question coming, task force 153 operates in which particular area? So you never know. Information can be asked in any way. You should be prepared to understand the information and utilize that as per your need. Next question is about WTO, World Trade Organization. Very, very popular organization and do expect questions coming on that. You are supposed to figure out which statements are correct. So we all know certain basic facts about the WTO, right? So yes, WTO is international organization, intergovernmental organization and the main purpose of WTO is to regulate, facilitate the international trade between the nations, between the member countries. With the headquarter at Geneva in Switzerland, this is world's largest international economic organization. Remember this fact, you never know in the MCQ, you may be asked this kind of information. Today, almost 164 member states are there as a member of WTO. India is also one of the founding members and these 164 countries itself represent 98% of the global trade. So you can understand what makes this WTO as largest international economic organization because the members are holding 98% global trade. When it was formulated, it was formed on 1st January 1995. And that WTO was actually established under the Marrakesh Agreement. So you may be asked this question, like recently we got the Baghdad conference, no? Baghdad conference was OEC, uh, o OPEC. Similarly, we have the Marrakesh agreement that under which the WTO was established. Okay, before that, before 1995, before WTO, there used to be GATT, which is General Agreement on Traffic, uh, Tariff and Trade. That was there. Now WTO replaced GATT. You, 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 may, uh, you may be asked this question as well. So, which, what was the predecessor of WTO? It was the GATT. Okay. And after many uh, negotiations, uh, all the negotiations of WTO are called the Uruguay Round. So, it's an eight-year long negotiation process under Uruguay Round. Finally, 1995 WTO was established. So, all these keywords are important. You may be asked, this Uruguay Round relates to what? So, it relates to WTO. Please remember, the WTO 
is international global organization but wto is not a part of un don't think everything is a part of un that operates globally right so but yeah of course of course the wto has very strong very good relations they work very closely but that does not make wto as a part of un the two things are very separate so their their relations are good but uh, their entities are quite different okay though un and wto their relations are governed by arrangement for effective cooperation with other intergovernmental organization relation between wto and they signed since 1995 the two have good relations but though they are not part of each other also remember one more thing guys that the wto mandate encompasses facilitation of the trade goods and services intellectual property so wto uh, works in a very broad domain wto is not about only about the trade facilitation so it it says the wto mandate wto work includes the trades in goods as well as service and not to forget the intellectual property as well so while wto prohibit the discriminatory practices among trading partner the main purpose is the countries must not discriminate between international partners when it comes to trading there has to be there has to be a very fair trading between the countries without any discrimination i mean what this what discrimination i i am not supposed to say i am not going to buy from this country i am going to buy from this country or if uh, if uh, one country uh, i am giving lot of tariff uh, you know concessions i am not supposed to restrict any country by putting more uh, taxations on that that can this, this is called discriminatory practice right so now very interestingly wto though prohibit discriminatory practice but like it sometimes it also allows certain exceptions so don't think that wto completely prohibit discriminatory practice there are some if and buts because you're talking about international relations right you're talking about international organizations you cannot have everything as one as per one module there would be some exceptions here and there especially when it comes to environmental protections when it comes to national security yeah some exceptions can be given important guys and when it comes to wto remember one thing very clearly the wto general council is wto's highest decision making body the wto general council meet under different different rules and we have for that purpose we have dispute settlement body we also have trade policy review now if you go back to the question guys you can clearly now you are in a position to understand how to figure out um, uh, the right or the wrong so you know india is a founding member absolutely india is a global player when it comes to global trade india has a very special position of course india is part of wto and it is a, it is founding founding member as well even statement number 4 is correct yes uh this meet has these two bodies intact but the problem is with second and third because wto is it a specialized organ it is under un it is not under un or the third statement says that wto pre- prohibit any kind of discriminatory practice it is too rigid this statement is too rigid we just have understood that you know mostly it prohibit the discrimination but it gives certain exceptions because of certain factors like environment protection national security so that makes only two as the right answer my opinion or my suggestion is now this question was a tough one but you can still take a risk to solve it at least one statement number 1 statement number 2 statement number 3 at least these three are very easily you can you can understand you can eliminate some of them with the fourth one you can still take a risk and you can go with the question but again depending on how, at, at what space you are if you are if you can afford taking risk if you can afford to have some negative marking then only go for it but for these kind of questions you really have to be careful try to try to prepare these very famous international bodies especially those who which are in news for example we have another one in news called international maritime organization imo now what which statements are correct let's first try to understand things about the imo guys so when it comes to imo international maritime organization it is a specialized agency of un unlike the wto imo is a specialized agency of un established 1948 initially the name was intergovernmental maritime consultative organizations later on it becomes imo 1982 okay very interestingly initially it was not a specialized agency of un but then in 
the it became a specialized agency with UN. It has right now it has 175 member states with three associate members. When it comes to India, yes, India also became member in 1959. But please remember, India is not a founding member. We joined later. Why this IMO was created? IMO's mandate objective is to promote the maritime safety. As the name says, it is International Maritime Organizations. So it is going to provide, promote maritime security, safety, environmental performances and they are going to do it. They are going to achieve this objective through development, adoption of the international rules and standards. Please remember one thing very interestingly, when it comes to IMO overall structure, the assembly within the IMO, it, the assembly is their highest governing body and the council which is elected by assembly only, council work as the executive organ. Two things are important. So it is as, as per the hierarchy, it is the assembly that actually elects the IMO council. Council's main work is to execute the things, governing body is the assembly. Now if you look at the question, now these two were actually interchanged guys. So IMO is specialized agency, yes. Is India founding member? No. This was created 1948, India joined 1959, India is not a founding member. Okay. And even third is wrong because the two things are interrelated. It says council as the highest governing body. No, it is the assembly as the highest governing body and council is the executive organ of IMO. I think this question was a medium one, but you guys could have solved it very easily by understanding the only option one is correct. India is not founding member and if you simply go by the definition of assembly or the council, you can still eliminate option two and three easily. Next is another important part, another important topic of international partnership and that is global partnership on artificial intelligence called GPAI. But the question is very tricky. It says which of the following is not a theme? Remember, which is not a theme of GPAI. So first you need to understand what is a GPAI and on what themes it, it is working. As the name says, global partnership on artificial intelligence. You can understand for the next few years, do read more on this. For the next couple of years, you are going to have questions coming on AI as well. So global partnership on AI is actually a multi-stakeholder initiative that was created to bridge the gap between the theory part of AI and the practical part of AI. So right now you know the AI is still a very new naive concept. Lot of AI is still based on the theory only. So this global partnership of AI was actually started, was initiated so as to minimize the gap between the theory and the practical part of AI and how they are going to do it by doing more and more research on AI. Okay, this partnership aims to bring experts from industry, civil society, government, academia. They want to bring all the great minds together to promote a responsible evolution of AI. See, understand this one thing guys. Artificial intelligence is a technology which is inevitable. There will be AI for sure. But now it comes to, now it comes the responsibility of the greatest minds that how we are going to develop the AI. AI should be, should be responsible AI, not something which is going to make things complicated for the humans, right? Now, this entire practice of making the responsible AI, this whole partnership is built on the ideas given by OECD recommendations on AI. Now, please read them as well. Very, very important star mark. So Organization of Econo uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, recommended some of the guidelines for AI and built on, on, based on that only we got this particular partnership. Right now, when it comes to the founding members, of course, all the great countries, all the technological advanced countries are members, including all this long list. Remember, India is also a key founding member of this partnership. So that is something you have to focus upon. This partnership was launched in 2020 and that time it was 15 members and now, right now it has more than 28 countries. So constantly this group is becoming larger and larger. India became the council chair of, the, of this uh, global partnership on AI 
in November 2022 after France. Now please understand the question was about the themes of the GPAI. So right now it is working on the four themes. The four themes make you understand the real purpose and the vision behind the GPAI, right? So this artificial intelligence global partnership has four major themes. It wants to create responsible AI, wants to create data governance, future of work, innovation and commercialization. Now the question was which of the following was not a theme but if you look at the question you say Are sir all the three are the part of the theme. So the statement is supposed to be D none which is not correct none is not correct means that means all are correct and you know there are not just three there are four themes in total so remember and this is my suggestion whenever whenever in any information uh, the themes are included or the indicators are included or the or the uh, or the you know basic dimensions are included some pillars are included do read them because that is where UPSC is going to target the question. So this question, I would say it was a tough one, but please forget about everything, forget about everything. You Let's say you don't know about global partnership, but at least you know about AI, no? You have the idea about the AI and you know the concerns, that much information you know, not specific, but you know what are the, what could be the benefit and what could be the concerns about the AI. At least this much you are listening around you very much. So think from that perspective. If you have to make a partnership, if you have to establish a global world level partnership, so what, how you are going to visualize, how, what is your aspiration, how you are going to deal with the concerns that relates to AI. So automatically these three things will come to your mind. Of course, whenever you have to make AI concern free, you will always think about the responsible AI. You will always try to make the things more into data governance. And that way, right? so if you go by that logic, if you if you know the basics of the concerns of AI, you can easily attempt it without even know, or at least you can risk it, right? Because because see, again, I'm telling you, sometimes with the common sense, you can solve this question. You just have to figure out the concerns and what can be done to take care of the concerns. Next question is with respect to United Nation. Convention Against Corruption, which is called UNCAC. Now, this particular question is with respect to UN Convention Against Corruption and you have to figure out which statement is not correct. Okay, now let's first try to understand the question, guys. Uh, this, this particular UNCAC, this is actually important because this, was en this entered into force in 2005, not a new organization, but this is important. Because this is the first legally binding international anti-corruption agreement. And because it is an anti-corruption agreement, of course, you can easily figure out India is also a member. Because India has a big problem of corruption, right? So, yes, remember the star mark point to be remembered. See guys, there are very few international agreements, conventions which are legally binding. So, you can't remember everything which is not legally binding, but you can surely remember those which are legally binding. So this UNCAC is the first legally binding uh, agreement on corruption. Now remember this very very carefully. Uh, it is the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime UNODC that is designated as a secretariat of this convention. Okay th this is very interesting as well. So right now UNDOC not the CSE publishes when it comes to the world drug report that is that actually belongs to uh, as the name says this drug report is going to belong to the office on drugs and crime so these two things are very separate now if you look at the question the problem is with the statement number three so very very easily you can say okay fine this is first legal part okay fine as the name says this is convention with respect to corruption so apply your common sense if there is any convention with respect to corruption do you think that corruption report is going to publish a drug report. Does that make any sense? Absolutely not. If there is a there is a convention on cor corruption and drugs are two very separate things. So clearly you can eliminate this option. Even if you do not know which organization publishes it. But at least you can figure out which surely cannot be my case. 
so three can be eliminated by very commonly understanding the corruption and the drugs are the two different things right similarly second statement is correct yeah fine uh, and and i mean this was this was a tricky thing of course um, it becomes very difficult to figure out that why any office on drugs and crime why why any office on drug and crime is going to be secretary of corruption convention but again if you look closely ultimately drugs and crime also are the basis or or somehow relates to the corruption part no if you go by that logic if you think like that you can figure out which statement is not correct two are correct only one is not correct answer is supposed to be only one okay now uh, many students will find first statement difficult because it because you can i mean you cannot guess if something is legally binding or not for that you have to be sure so in my opinion uh, eliminating or talking about second and third was still easy but figuring out the first one one was difficult that makes this question as a tough one but something you can take little bit of risk you can take a little bit of risk at least by eliminating the statement number 3 so yes that that how you can think that's how you can go with the question next question number 16 now this is the pure this is this is one of the favorite uh, practice of the upsc these days places in news and the location so here you are given three places the manag the managua socotra and saint lucia islands let's see how many of them are correct as per the question so first where is this managua managua is actually the capital of nicaragua and nicaragua you can clearly see this is the location of nicaragua guys it belongs to the central american country nicaragua is central american nations and uh, there are two big lakes called nicaragua and managua and both are connected by the tipitapa river and because it was in news that actually that that is why you have to remember the locations places in news are very very important right and then second was with respect to socotra where is socotra guys you can clearly see socotra island is a very strategic choke point uh that is that is between the gulf of aden and the arabian sea now this is your arabian sea this is your gulf of aden right and here was the babal mandab if you still remember and this is your red sea this is your persian gulf this is strait of hormuz this is gulf of oman so between gulf of aden and arabian sea you have this strategic very strategic island country called socotra island also remember this socotra island is unesco world heritage site because of its vibrant and very rare bio diversity uh, again when it comes to uh, saint lucia it is also a sovereign country which is a part which is in caribbean sea again it is known for its volcanic peaks and rainforest you can see here this is your saint lucia just just south of puerto rico and north of the venezuela so here is where we have the saint lucia now if you if you go back to the question guys uh, which place is correctly matched so very common question so as you can say the first and the third are correct so clearly socotra island is not located in persian gulf you have seen socotra is between the arabian sea and the gulf of aden so you have seen so second being incorrect uh, the statement how many are correctly the two are correctly matched question was easy could have been attempted but 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 caution there is no space for guesswork so you have to be 100% sure absolutely no scope of guesswork and again because of the upsc's new pattern there is no scope of elimination as well so be careful while attempting this question number 17 was with respect to pradhan mantri samman nidhi which is pm kisan yojana now again this these all the schemes you really have to be very careful about what we what most important things we have to remember about the pm kisan yojana so pm kisan yojana which was started way back in 2018 this scheme is very very important for small and marginal land holding farmers why because the the scheme actually aims to supplement the financial needs of the farmers and in order to do that under the pradhan mantri kisan yojana farmers are given 6000 rupees in three equal installments of 2 to 1000 rupees but very important thing 
only that farmer only that farmer is going to get the benefit of the kisan pm kisan yojana where the farmer is having some kind of uh, farmland and that too cultivable non -cult cultivable land is not going to be the part only only then government can help because under the pm kisan yojana uh, it the government gives you 2 2000 rupees in the three cropping seasons in in india we have the three major cropping season na? we have the kharif season the rabi season and the zaid season so for every cropping season government gives you some some support uh, uh, like like a 2000 rupees support in each cropping season so there are conditions so only small marginal farmers which are these small marginal farmers see the the word small marginal farmer means farmer having less than or up to 2 hectare land only that farmer is going to be covered and that this is important guys in india 80% farmers are small and marginal farmers so you can understand the importance of this particular scheme but again the farmer must have a cultivable land non cultivable are not into that this is a central sector scheme that means entire funding is to be done by the central government the nodal ministry is ministry of agriculture farmer welfare please remember like i already told you that uh, the eligible all the eligible farmers are going to receive 6000 annually with three equal installments every four months that is the whole process now if you look at the statement look at the question guys so clearly the statement three is incorrect so you know it is not giving 1000 rupees monthly that will make the things as 12000 so clearly pm kisan is giving 6000 in total to 2000 installments so three is incorrect even first is incorrect why because it says the pm kisan yojana is going to cover both the cultivable and non cultivable land and i specifically mentioned only the support to be given for cultivable land the land that can be cultivated which is good and fit for cultivation not for the wasteland not for the non cultivable land so only and only one statement is correct only one statement is correct this question was a medium one but something that i could have attempted very easily guys very easily because we know about this scheme it's a very popular scheme and apply your common sense why the support is to be given for the non cultivable land of course that makes no sense no logic and we know there is absolutely no there is not even a single scheme by the government that is given farmers 1000 rupees monthly we know there is not just about this this there is absolutely no scheme that is giving 1000 rupees on monthly basis understand so that way i can eliminate certain things and i can get my answer as only one next question is with respect to the cooperative societies so of course you should expect a lot of questions coming on cooperative societies because in the last couple of years cooperative societies cooperative framework are very much in news we know that what are cooperative societies the cooperatives if you go by the normal definition cooperatives are voluntary democratic autonomous organizations which are controlled by their members because members are actually the consumers also and they have stakeholder they, they are stakeholder as well so please remember it is the state government it is the state government that regulate the state cooperative societies but when it comes to multi state cooperative societies they are actually under the control of the parliament parliament can legislate on the matters relating to incorporation regulation winding up of the multi state because and if there is any cooperative within a state then you have state cooperatives and that is to be regulated by state government but when it comes to multi state cooperatives then you have the power uh, in the hands of parliament remember this fact this is going to be important for the uh, for the exam guys now very recently what ha what has happened some of the amendments some rules were notified uh, with respect to the multi state cooperative societies and these new amended rules were notified in 2023 as per the new provisions there is supposed to be reservation of two seats for women one for SCST on the board of the multi-state cooperative society this is a very very important thing or very important amendment that has recently been done to give more representation to the women and SCST community okay remember that please 
Now the provision of the cooperation election authority for timely regulatory elections has been included. There is a mandatory quorum of one third elected member has to be there to conduct any of the board meeting. And this is very important. Now if you look at the question guys, if you go back to the question you will see sir, both statements are wrong. Why? Has, has the new statements, has the new rule says one third seats means 33% seat? No. Only two seats, not even in percentage, clearly. Two seats are reserved for women, not one third seats. That is not the case with the state, with the multi-state cooperatives. Then it says the parliament is going to control all cooperative societies. No. Only the multi-state cooperative societies are to be controlled by the parliament. Because when it comes to the state cooperative societies, then it is going to be the state government responsible. So clearly both statements are wrong. And both statements, and now you can solve the two with a common sense as well. So wherever, I, I warn you n number of times, wherever you have the words like only, all, very careful. 95% the chances are there is some kind of hidden information inside that. And of course that reserving one third seats for women in multi-state can be little uh, confusing. But now you know the fact, it's only two women which are being reserved. So in this case, yeah, the question was, I would say it was a medium level, but something you can take a risk upon because if you, you know, read it carefully, you may get some clues inside that question. The next question is with respect to the Udan scheme. Udan scheme is Ude Desh Ka Aam Nagrik. So you have to consider the following statements and give the right answer. So please remember, uh, what is this Udan? Ude Desh Ka Aam Nagrik. So as you know, as the name says, I'm, we are trying to create a system where the common man of the country can, can fly, can fly, use the air, aviation sector, can use the aeroplane airlines at a very affordable prices. So for that purpose, India got National Civil Aviation Policy 2016. It is the Ministry of Civil Aviation, they have started the so-called Udan, Ude Desh Ka Aam Nagrik, Regional Connectivity Scheme. And they have started this for regional airport development so that more and more regional connectivity can be increased in India where affordable flights can be carried between the multiple states. And the whole exercise, the whole Udan scheme, it is the airport authority of India that is designated as the nodal agency for implementing the scheme. So two things you have to remember. Then when it comes to the objective, objective is very simple. As the name says itself, we want to improve the air, air connectivity, especially the air connectivity to the remote areas, to those areas of India, which are right now they are underserved or they are unserved at all. Like those connecting those areas which are not being connected by airlines so far. So we want to improve the air connectivity. That's why the name is regional connectivity. And we want to make the people, the common people, we want to make them enable to access the air travel very affordable rates, especially, especially if the target is tier 2, tier 3 cities. I'm not targeting the metropolitan. I'm not targeting the tier 1 cities because they already have good connectivity. Now the focus is connecting the tier 2, tier 3 cities and there exactly you have more common people residing. Yeah. Now, but of course, if you have to make the things affordable, of course, government has to intervene because normally uh, the flight operations are not very cheap. Of course, that's why the flight tickets are not very cheap. But now the government says half of the seats of the Udan flights are going to be offered at a subsidized fare. And when the, the fare is going to be subsidized, then only a common man can afford that. But for that purpose, how the compensation is to be done? Because that way though, the, the air, airlines are going to be lost. But to compensate that subsidized fares, government is going to support the airlines by viability gap funding, which is VGF. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of government grant, which government is going to give to the airlines to bridge that cost. Please remember, viability gap funding is never going to be provided for cargo airlines because here we are not subsidizing things for the cargo operation. They are commercial operations. The aim of the VGF is just to subsidize and bridge the gap for, the, for those flights which are going to carry the passengers. 
because we want to improve their experience right now in this case very clearly you can see all the statements are absolutely correct without any issue without any problem so very easy question because already it is in news for so many years and by now the information should be etched in your head so very interesting and important question still relevant so that was question number 19 last question is with respect to the government e marketplace so what is this government e marketplace and what i am supposed to remember please let's try to understand what is a government e marketplace as the name says it 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 must be connected to the government procurement when it comes to government e marketplace it is supposed to be a public procurement portal public procurement portal because all the government and states all the central and state government ministries departments public sectors are going to procure goods and services using this portal for all kind of public procurement we have created this one portal called government e marketplace doesn't matter if you are a central government or state government any ministry any department of the government always has to use this platform this portal to buy and sell the goods to procure all the goods and services this is not a new concept it was started way back in 2016 why it was started to bring the transparency and efficiency to the government buying process you see the government buying procurement has to be transparent if the government procurement is not transparent it can actually get the seeds of corruption so to make the whole thing whole procurement corruption free it must be efficient it must be transparent and to solve that purpose government e marketplace was started now this government e marketplace it's a hundred percent government of india owned company which was set up under the ministry of commerce in fact in 2017 government of india made it mandatory compulsory for all ministries that every procurement of goods and services is to be done by this portal only there will be no other way of public procurement and that was notified by ministry of commerce so now if you look at the question both statements are absolutely correct one and two so now the answer is supposed to be c so this was a question on government e-marketplace so you can easily figure out even by understanding what an e-marketplace is going to be okay this must be some portal for marketplace is something where you go sell buy purchase things right and now it because it is a government marketplace so you can easily relate it to the public procurement portal okay now of course this this second thing can be difficult to figure out if it is a hundred percent government owned company because there can be uh, some private share as well i mean this was a difficult thing to guess because uh, even uh, if it is a 51 percent government it can still be called a government company but you you are not sure so be careful about this if uh, i mean the percentage most of the times they are wrong in this case it was a correct one so solve this question you can easily attempt but again with the caution you have to be cautious with with this kind of specific numbers when they are in question guys right? so these were the first 20 questions i really hope you have enjoyed our video what specific things you have learned for the first time i am eagerly waiting to know what new things you have learned from this video do let me know in the comment section box hope you have enjoyed and learned a lot thank you so much guys see you very very soon with the second part till then keep watching the videos on pmfis uh, keep supporting our videos and do tell us about your experience of the upsc preparation if you have any doubt with respect to the upcoming prelims don't shy put your queries into the comment section box and i'll personally address your queries if you have any doubt with respect to prelims you are most welcome to put your queries in the comment section box and do not forget to check out the test series link that is also given in description thank you so much god bless you take care jai hind jai bharat